Amen. Guys, praise the Lord. Great job. You can go back down to your seats there. Let's all stand together, please. We're going to sing those two wonderful verses. Brethren, we have met. Let's all sing together. You ready? Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy man will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all Good evening. Welcome to Lancaster Baptist Church. What a blessing to see God working in our church already this summer. And I'm thankful for the good reports from camps and various outreaches with respect to those that have been saved and discipled. Tonight, Brother Larry Chapel, our youth pastor, is going to open God's Word and challenge us with biblical truths for this summertime. May we have our hearts ready and our Bibles ready, and let's be encouraged tonight as we hear the promises of God proclaimed from the Word of God. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms. Psalms 139. Psalms 139. And it has been a great day in church. The music has been awesome. Even that choir just a moment ago was great. And uh, just another uh, privilege to open God's Word. Psalms 139, and for, for tonight, I'm going to have you stay seated, and let me read a couple verses to you. 139, verse number 13 says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. Tonight, I'd like to bring a message uh, entitled, How God Sees the Unborn. How God Sees the Unborn. And unless you've been living under a rock, you've noticed that this is a highly charged, emotionally charged topic in society today. Whether it comes uh, from a, a hearing of a Supreme Court nominee or a decision in New York or Georgia or about Alabama recently, it's a highly uh, charged, emotionally charged topic in our, in our nation. Uh, to say that it's a divisive issue, I think, would be to say uh, it's an understatement. Uh, the tension of this issue comes from many different opinions and interests that pull on this topics, and there's so much at stake. There would be some that say there's the woman's rights, or there's the individual's rights, or the rights of privacy, or uh, the rights of the unborn. Some would, would, would chime in, oh, this is an issue of separation of church and state. So you've got all these different angles coming at this, and what we've seen in our nation is this massive collision occurring around this one issue. I think the one thing that everyone would agree on is that there's no gray area in this. There's no room for compromise, and I think both sides would say that. Uh, the stakes are too high. This isn't a new issue either. Uh, uh, Hippocrates, who we have the Hippocratic Oath, if you're a doctor, you've taken that oath back in uh, 400 BC. It was mentioned, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. 
Uh, Plato and Aristotle, however, uh, were in favor of abortion. And there was abortions that took place in the New Testament. The early church uh, in documents about a 100 AD uh, said uh, and wrote, thou shalt not murder a child by abortion. So this isn't a new issue, but God's word gives us clarity. And tonight I'd like to address the question, how does God view the unborn? Uh, I, I pray tonight from God's word we'll get some biblical perspective on this. This message is not just fodder for debate. There's a lot of debate that takes place. Maybe you've seen stuff online, social media. That's, that's not my, my prayer tonight. It's just more ammunition for a debate. There's plenty of good books that I could even recommend to you if, if you're looking for that. I, th- I think we'll see some things tonight that I pray will be helpful to us as a body of believers. That's not just about winning a debate. Um, I want to say this, and these are all just kind of some introductory m- remarks. I want to acknowledge in a room this size that uh, statistically there would be some in this room who've had an abortion. And we can't lessen what God calls abortion. It's murder. Um, and the, the guilt that you feel, I'm sure, is awful. And here's my, my, what I want to say to you, is that as deep as the guilt may be, understand that God's grace is deeper than that. Yeah. And that uh, what the devil would love to use to shame you, God can use to shape you. And, uh, and I just want to say that just at the outset, because I know for someone in this room, uh, some individuals, this may be really hard to hear. The last thing I want to say before we get started is one of the reasons that abortion, I believe, has become such commonplace in our nation is the abortion industry has done, worked really hard to sanitize the image and the look of abortion. Okay, um, to to hide the dirty details. Now, uh, because tonight is kind of a family night, including my own daughters in here, we're not going to get into really some of the grisly details, but they're there. It's disgusting. We're not going to play videos of an abortion happening, but they're there, and it's disgusting. And I believe it's grieving to God. I believe we'll see later. I believe it angers God. And so tonight, because it's a family night and there are younger kids in here, we're not going to get into that. But I also believe that's one of the reasons that the abortion industry has thrived because it's got this sanitized image that it tries to portray. And so we read this scripture that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's have a word of prayer now as we, as we move into this uh, discussion. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the clarity that your word gives to us. And God, I pray that you would guide my thoughts tonight. I pray that this would be helpful uh, to many in in, uh, the congregation here tonight. And I just pray, God, that you would would change our nation as we celebrate Independence Day here. God, our nation desperately needs you. And one of the indicators of how far we've run is the prevalence of abortion in our country. And I pray that you would send revival, revival And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, The tone of uh, of this message, I can't help. It's such a heavy topic. Uh, As I'm studying it, it weighs on my heart. I think it weighs on my heart uh, because I've got three young, or two girls and one on the way. I got one on the oven. And if you thought I was excited about a cucumber today or this morning or a zucchini, I'm I'm proud about the the, the number three that we have on the way. I had a coach tell me, when you go from two to three, you go from man to man to, uh, to zone, defense. So we're about to go from man to man to zone. I mean, in the middle. Listen, sometimes my wife and I am like, are, are, are we sure we're, we're ready for another? And I, ready or not, here it comes. We've got three. And uh, the third one is uh, a girl. And we've known that since one of the earliest appointments. And uh, we went in and we, we heard it was a girl. After that, we didn't tell everyone it was a girl. But a lot of people came up to me and like, hey, maybe this time it'll be a boy. I'm like, yeah, probably not. I already know it's a girl, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I love that. I love girls. My girls are awesome. I, I honestly can say that God, God knows us, and I, 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 love, I love the girls that he's given to us. Um, I think I got a picture of an ultrasound here. This is, uh, this is number three. On, we don't have a name yet. My wife, my wife picks names. And I'm like, Where, is that even a name? That's just like, that's a random object. That's like a conglomeration of letters. That's not even a name, you know? Let, and one, number one rule for picking a name, Ashley, it has to at least be a name, and then we'll discuss it. She's, so this one's unnamed right now, but this was from a, a, a little while ago. Uh, but I remember holding Leighton for the first time, and as 
we had been anticipating her. And I remember holding her and thinking, this is who we've been praying for. This is who we've been anticipating. These are the, we've seen you in the black and white images, but now just, just to hold you. And when Blair came along, it was all just intensified again. Now we're expecting our third appointment. And uh, we've, we've, uh, we're thankful for the good news. It's, it's not always good news. We've had bad appointments. We've had appointments where we've gone in and they couldn't find a heartbeat. And we're thankful for the grace of God that he's given to us and allowing us to, to, to have our third. But this appointment that we had uh, this last week, it was an anatomy scan. And they go in there and they look at just to make sure they measure everything to make sure the baby's tracking. And praise God, it was, it was, it's growing on schedule and it's tracking all well. But what's tragic about this appointment is that some use this appointment to make a determination on whether they'll keep the baby, depending on what they'll see. And that breaks my heart to think that that someone can make a decision based on something not measuring right that they would terminate a pregnancy. A while ago, this is about 10 years ago, Starbucks had a campaign and it was called The Way I See It. And if you want to remember that, it was on the cups. If you got a Starbucks coffee cup, on the cup, it would say the way I see it, and then they would number it. It was numbered by, it was quotes by uh, celebrities and news anchors and politicians and everyone. If, it was like you're given a blank cup and you could just kind of just say whatever you want on it. And that's what happened on these cups. It was the way I see it. And there's even some pastors that were written on there. So all these different perspectives. And everyone got to say whatever they wanted to say on that cup. So you get a cup and you kind of look at it and you see the way I see it. Tonight, all that really matters is the way that God sees it. Amen. That's all that really matters. That's all that matters on this issue is how does God see the unborn? I want to draw your attention to a few things. The first thing that we see in Scripture is that God values life. God values life. He is the author of life. He is the architect of life. He is the creator, the sustainer of life. And it is God, Job tells us, who gives that life. Job, he went through a lot, and yet he recognized, God, you're the giver of life, he said in Job 10, verse 12. He's the giver of life, and this life, because it comes from God, this life is sacred. It has special value and significance. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26, And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Human life is significant because we bear the image of God. This is what theologians call the imago Dei. We bear it. No one else bears the image of God. And this is still reflected to some degree in our societies because human life is protected more than than other life. But, But listen, human life is a gift from God. We're made in the image of God. And abortion is an assault on the image of God. Any murder is an assault on the image of God. The Bible says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, this is in Genesis, by man shall uh, blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. Unrestricted abortion has been aided by an increasingly secularized society that appears to view human life as merely the highest form of evolution. But no greater moral significance than animals that could be afforded more protection in law than an unborn child. There are reflections of this in humanity. We, we'll, we'll crowd around a TV from time to time because maybe there's a group of uh, soccer players who's trapped in a cave or a, a group of uh, sailors that are trapped in a submarine. And we, we see that to a degree. This is reflected in human life that we value life. But God is the originator, the architect, and he values life. Because he creates sustained life, human life is special, significant, and sacred. God also validates the human life of the unborn. It's not just all life. And I think as believers, we should be consistent in this biblical ethic that we too, like God, value life. From the unborn to the young to the old, God values life and so should we. But God values and validates the life of the unborn. Let me give you a few uh, verses here. The one we read just a moment ago. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me. I mean, or thou, thou knit me uh, in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. 
And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. There's a, there's a portion of scripture in Exodus that says, If men strive to hurt a woman with a child, so her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follows, he shall surely be punishment. You read on, it talks about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, meaning if you cause harm to the unborn baby, there are consequences to that. Luke chapter number one, we read of Elizabeth. She heard the salutation of Mary, and the babe leapt in her womb. In the next chapter, it's speaking of Jesus here, it says, And you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Here's the point. Scripture makes no differentiation between the unborn child in Luke 1 and the born child in Luke 2. And this happens in the Old Testament as well, that God validates human life. So when does human life begin? And who gets to decide that? Every time that the unborn life is mentioned in Scripture, no matter what stage, personhood has been attributed. Uh, this, is, this is what a pro-choice advocate will argue. Like, it's, oh, maybe it might be, it's amazing. We'll travel how far to different distant planets in search of life, and we'll acknowledge that life, but then we'll ignore the life of, of developing in the womb. But what a pro-choice uh, advocate would say is like, no, it's not a personhood yet. But every time you have God addressing an individual in the womb in Scripture, there's personhood attributed. God says, I knew you. I formed you. That God knows who we are at conception. Amen. So we know that, that we know that in the womb, God, God assigns value and says this is a person. So when did that start? Now, now even, even uh, David said this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David's saying, like, when my mother conceived me, I was there. And I was, I was conceived in iniquity and in sin. And so... If you back up from, from, from birth and we say, if God says that human life in the womb is life, it is a person, the next clearest line of marcation is conception. That's, that's the clearest place to go. And so there will be some that say, well, what about when it's viable? Maybe that's when it becomes human life, when it's, when it's viable. Uh, even Roe v. Wade and which is, is precedent in our nation. And by the way, not every precedent's a good precedent. Uh, so you'll hear that on the news sometimes. Well, it's precedent, it's precedent. There are such things as a bad precedent. I think this would be one case in point, Roe v. Wade. And so in Roe v. Wade, it speaks of viability. It says, when the fetus becomes potentially able to live outside of the mother's womb, it's usually placed about seven months or 28 weeks. Well, you know what's happened? Viability has lowered in the decades since Roe v. Wade. And Roe v. Wade, they said maybe, maybe 28 weeks. Well, now, even just a couple years ago, I think there's a news article here. At 21 weeks old, a, a baby was born and survived. And by the way, is thriving. I don't think viability is a good, good measure. Uh, there are, there are, there are um, adults that are involved in traumatic accidents, and their life would not be viable if not sustained by medical support. Is their life no longer valuable? So viability, is a, it's a bad measure. What about uh, cognizance or the ability to, to think or be awake? Well, can I kill you when you're sleeping? Can I kill you when you're not? Because some will say, well, when, the, when they have cognizance, that's when, that's when life begins. Uh, what about a heartbeat? Okay, that, 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 that wouldn't work well for anyone in here who has a pacemaker, whose heart doesn't beat on their own. Are you less valuable because cause, cause your heart doesn't beat unassisted? Um, the clearest demarcation before birth is conception. Now, science agrees with this, and this is one of the things. We've actually seen um, some good strides on this issue, and I think the, the, the science is helping us out. Uh, the, the science in this regard shows the interest, intricacy as, as, as we read in the scriptures that God designed us and he, 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 he wove us, he knit us together in the womb. The human life is amazing. It's so fragile, yet so durable. It works together. It just blows my mind uh, how human life works. And science supports this. January 1st, let's say, is, is, is the day of conception, just for instance. On the very day of conception, 46 of the chromosomes are present. 
The, the, all the pro chromosomes are present for new life. So human life has already begun. This is a unique human being, a unique genetic makeup that can't be reproduced or replaced. January 22nd, and I know this is small on the screen, but I'll read it here. It says, only about three weeks after conception, the child's heart begins to beat, pumping her own blood. By the way, oftentimes the different blood from the mother. It's not just a, a clump of cells or a tissue in the womb. It's a, it's a different being. A lot of times, a different blood type completely. A January, February 4th, in the fifth week, which is many times when mothers confirm they are pregnant, uh, the child has eyes, legs, and hands begin to develop. By Valentine's Day, January, or February 14th, which is merely six weeks after conception, brain waves have already been, they've already been active, now they're being detected. In late February, uh, uh, only the seventh week from conception, the baby starts kicking and swimming. Just another week after that, just our two months into pregnancy, every organ, listen to this, every organ in the child's body is in place. The bones are already taking shape and the fingerprints have already begun to form. That blows my mind. We have this book at home since uh, Ashley's expecting, and it'll tell us what stage, what's, what's happening in our baby this week. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, it, I'll, sometimes I'll ask Ashley, what size is it? It's always a fruit, you know? I don't know why. It, to me, a golf ball, softball, tennis ball, that way it makes sense, right? <laughs> you guys have seen this. Like, fruit, they're all different sizes, right? They can be all different sizes. But they're always, oh, she, she, it's the size of an egg or, or a uh, grapefruit or this or that. Mid-March, the baby's teeth have begun to form, fingernails develop. Uh, the baby can turn her head. This is all the first trimester here and, and can even frown. Then late March, the baby can grasp objects placed in her hand. Uh, oh, Ashley told me this just a few weeks ago when we went in for an ultrasound. She read, they're grasping objects now. Guess what happened? We went and saw the ultrasound, the live ultrasound. The, our baby's grabbing the umbilical cord. Tell me that's not a person. You look at that and tell me it's not a person. Uh, late April, the baby can start having dreams. It's amazing what, how God has formed in the womb and what he does. I think the human conscience to a degree agrees with this as well. There's a, there's a company called Save the Storks. And Save the Storks, they have a simple mission and their mission is to get, they, they park a van outside of Planned Parenthood and they, they invite uh, uh, pregnant mothers to come into the van just to see an ultrasound, just to see an image of the baby. And it's nice, you can see on the inside, it's nice, it's clean, it's beautiful. This is, what, this is their statistic. And by the way, I, did a lot, I tried to do a lot of research on this and there's, one of the things I found is that the abortion industry lies. About everything you look up, you, you try to find a statistic, and they, they lie. And, and, but this, this company, Save the Storks, have seen that 84% of mothers decide not to have an abortion after seeing an ultrasound of their baby. The American Journal of Ethics doesn't like this idea. They said this, requiring viewing interferes with the decision-making model. That's the point. That's the point. They should see what they're doing. So science agree. I believe to some degree the human conscience agrees, uh, agrees with this. The abortion industry agrees that this is a baby. We know this because they've sold baby parts in the last few years. There was one uh, lady, her name was Abby Johnson. She was a fer former director of Planned Parenthood. And she said that she was in the clinic... And she's, she's a pro-life advocate now. She said she was in the clinic, and I could see the whole profile of the baby, 13 weeks, head to foot. I could see the whole side profile. I could see the probe. I could see the baby try to move away from the probe. And it changed her forever. She thought, what am I doing here? Never again. And she left. Uh, the, the, I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, there was one, and it's funny because all the newspapers will call him an activist, an extremist, because he recorded these conversations with Planned Parenthood executives. He's a crazy man because he recorded a conversation, not to mention that the conversations were uh, uh, discussing the selling of human body parts. Uh, let me read this to you. One Planned Parent executive said this. And, and they said, by the way, they came out and said that the videos were edited. I don't know if you saw this in the news. They said the videos were edited. Uh, the courts ruled that the videos were not edited, by the way. 
One Planned Parenthood executive said, We've been very good at getting the heart, the lung, the liver, because I basically know that I'm going to crush this part, and then I'm going to crush below that. Then I'm going to crush above and try to leave all that intact. In fact, sometimes they'll talk a, a, a pregnant mother into, uh, having a, 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 uh, into breaching the baby so that way they can harvest different parts of the body more effectively and sell them. One person said, it's weird how clumps of cells magically become intact livers and hearts once it's time for Planned Parenthood to harvest that baby for cash. It's disgusting. Since God acknowledges life in the womb, and he does that at all stages, and life begins at conception, the ending of this life any, at any point is murder. Uh, let me give you this, because maybe this will be helpful. This was helpful to me. Um, there's uh, 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 Scott Klusendorf of the Life Training Institutes, and he points out that there are only four differences between a preborn and a newborn. Here are the only four differences, and it's the acronym SLED. First of all, is size. This is the only difference between an unborn baby and a born baby. What's the only difference? Size. Does how big you are determine who you are? Does... does does being, uh, to, to being a bit larger, does that mean you're, 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 you have more humanity? Next was the level of development. Are 20-year-olds uh, humans, uh, are they more humans than like 10-year-olds? They're, they're smarter, they're stronger. Are they more human? What about the environment? Does being inside a house make you more or less of a person than being outside? Does the environment where you are dictate how you are more or less of a human? It, it, it's crazy to me. The, the birth canal, it's, it's seven inches. It's a seven inch difference. And yet those who advocate for abortion would say that that's the difference. The seven inches. In a mere matter of minutes. Now it's okay to kill this baby. And now it's not seven inches in a minute or two. Uh, next, the degree of dependency. Does how dependent you are determine your value as a person? I've got a grandmother who's uh, severely battled Alzheimer's. Doesn't know who I am. Doesn't really know who, who she even is. She's dependent. There are those in this room that are dependent on medication. Does your degree of dependency determine your value? SLED. I, I, I thought this was a helpful uh, acronym for us to remember. So how has this all happened? How has abortion become acceptable? 1.3 million children are killed annually in the United States. More are killed every year than the combined Americans killed in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I and II, the Korean War, Vietnam, Persian Gulf, Iraq, and Afghan wars combined. More babies are killed than Americans that have been killed in all of those conflicts. And that's every single year. 22% of all pregnancies end in abortion. By the age, uh, uh, a woman by the age of 35, uh, 45, 3 in 10 women have terminated their pregnancies. There have been approximately 57 million legal abortions in the United States since 1973. And about every year, 75 million abortions take place globally. Why? Why does this happen? Here's a few reasons, and the first one is this, human depravity, the wicked hearts and nature of man. We talked about this a little bit this morning, the flesh of man, it is human depravity. The Bible says in John 3, this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Listen, we are strangers and pilgrims living in a wicked land. Issues of abortion, sexual sins, these are the direction that a godly society, godless society steers. This is what a go you take, and it's amazing too, you take God out of the picture. How has that fared for our country? Well, what about the school shootings? And what about the abortions? And what about this? And what about that? When we remove God. Now, listen, this is the direction that a godless society steers, steers towards these things. Let's turn to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number one paints a picture of a godless society. And I think you'll agree with me in just a moment. We're there. We are there. Romans chapter number one, verse number 21 says this, because that when they knew God, 
We've got him on our money, don't we? And God, we trust. He's on all the buildings as you walk around Washington, D.C. We pledge allegiance to him and city council meetings across our nation. So we, we know God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. I'm going to give you some just foolish things that take place in our nation every single day. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the, an image made like unto corruptible man. That's what a godless society does. That does that change God to reflect whatever they want God to look like. And... Uh, Corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, this was assault on the image of God. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one uh, toward another, men with women working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of the reward which was meet. And listen to this, verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. We talked about these this morning. Maliciousness, full of envy, murder. That's what we're talking about tonight. Debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedience, to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural uh, affection, implacable, unmerciful. Listen to this. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that they do, them uh, that do them. And so even that there's so much shame in it, they take pleasure in it. They celebrate their godlessness. This is something that occurred this last year uh, with, and maybe you heard it, shout your abortion. This was a campaign and, and thousands and thousands of, of, of women who murdered their baby then bragged about the fact that they murdered their baby. There's no shame in it. The, 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 the supporters, as uh, the governor of New York signed the Reproductive Health Act, which basically lifts any sort of restrictions on abortions to where the abortions can happen anytime, uh, right up until birth. When they signed that, there was a crowd chanting, free abortion on demand. We can do it. Yes, we can. Then the governor lit the uh, Empire State Building. He, he, he lit it up all pink to, uh, to celebrate this achievement. What achievement? There's one author who wrote of this event. He's a Christian author in the Christian Post. And he said this, The unfettered taking of unborn lives is celebrated. Take note. The pro-choice movement just revealed its true face. It's not about a choice. It's about glorifying, even idolizing death as the path to a good life with cult-like glee. Lord have mercy. That's what we just read in Romans chapter number one. On a lighter note, I clipped this in here. This is, have you guys heard of the Babylon Bee? The Babylon Bee? It's a satirical news. It's not a real newspaper. Here's what it said. This is a fake headline. Disney CEO, to avoid filming among the depraved and moral people, we are moving our Georgia operations back to Hollywood. <laughs> Catch the sarcasm there. Like, hey, we don't want to do anything with those immoral people in Georgia that don't want <laughs> abortions, they, that care for the life of the unborn. How immoral is that? We're going to go back to the, the moral, you know, bastion of goodness, Hollywood. Abortion activists worship abortion. It is sacred to them. It is the holy ground in which this ritual is performed over a thousand times a day. The Canaanites did this. I've seen it in the Holy Land. These Canaanite altars where they would sacrifice their, their, uh, their, uh, their, their, their children to pagan deities. 
the rise in abortion, the prevalence, and, 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 and even Roe v. Wade, if, if you look at it, 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 is, it is linked to the sexual revolution that took place in this country. And that, that was before I was even born, so some of you could lecture me more on it. But what was happening is, right, free love. Free love. And so guys could jump in and out of bed with whoever they want, but what was happening is what uh, women were becoming pregnant. So what are they supposed to do? What, what about free love? How, guys are jumping in and out of bed. What, what about, what about the, the, the women? And uh, so the sexual, let me give you this quote, so the sexual revolution with its free love really set the stage for the massacring of millions of babies who are nothing but intrusion in fornications and adulteries of, rec- of a wretched, degenerate society. Planned Parenthood, Dr. William Cates wrote a, a paper and he titled it this, Abortion as Treatment for Unwanted Pregnancy, the Second Sexually Transmitted Disease. A pregnancy, according to Planned Parenthood, is a sexually transmitted disease, and you deal with it through abortion. This is crazy. Do you know in Massachusetts it's illegal to give a goldfish away as a prize? You have a contest, you give away a gold, that's illegal. It's illegal to ship a lobster that's pregnant. That has the, you, can, you can see when a lobster is pregnant, all the eggs are underneath the back fin. You can't touch those. You can't uh, 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 consume those or uh, harvest those. They're protected. It's a fine. Uh, do you know, in, I was in Washington where my in-laws live. They have uh, uh, bald eagles. They're awesome. They fly around. There's a feather on the ground. Do you, do you know that feather is protected? You know, if I were to take that feather home and I would work that beautiful eagle ether feather into a piece of art, I would, could be fined $250,000 and face imprisonment for an inanimate feather? Our world's crazy. The boiling of a lobster is illegal because it's harmful and hurtful to the lobster. There's a group, I'm not even kidding, you can Google this, there's a group called Crustacean Compassion. And it's all about having compassion for the lobsters because they can, they can feel pain. And this is what the, one of the guys said. When we looked into the science and found how much research there had been into lobster pain, we were shocked. There was so much evidence. I'm not making, this is not a joke. There was so much evidence for pain. Okay, you want to talk about pain? You want to talk about scientific pain? Maureen Condick, she's a PhD. She's testified before uh, Congress before. She got her PhD from the University of Berkeley. She did a study on pain. Do you know when, you know when babies feel pain? As, as far as we can tell, at least by eight weeks old, babies feel pain. And we ignore that. No, she said, knowing the unborn child feels pain in early pregnancy, the question is what to do. Imposing pain on any pain-capable living creature is cruelty. Even this past week, there was a news article that I saw where a 27-year-old mom got in a fight with somebody else. And in that fight, she ended up uh, miscarrying. She, she suffered damage to her baby in that fight, and, and her baby was lost. Do, do you know what's happening in that case right now? The grand, jury is, the grand jury is hearing that case, and a DA is deciding whether to press charges because the life of the unborn was lost. Now, this doesn't make any sense to me because we might press charges against her, but she could have walked into an abortion clinic herself and killed the baby, no harm, no foul. So why has this happened? Because of the godless society, because of the human depravity. I think the next reason that abortions become so prevalent is selfish irresponsibility. If you're taking notes, write this down. The number one reason for having an abortion today, the number one, the leading reason for an abortion is convenience. Abortion has never been about a choice. It has been about escaping the consequences of a choice and taking away all the choices of another human being. It is killing one in the self-interest of another. Listen, there was an article back in 2011, the New York Times article entitled Two Minus One. They didn't give the mother's real name, but they they refer to her as Jenny in this article. And Jenny uh, was, was hoping to become pregnant, had already had a couple kids and wanted another one. They wanted just one more kid to cap things off. And she found out, she went in for an ultrasound, that she had twins. So what she decided to do was terminate one of the twins. 
It's called the two minus one pregnancy. Listen to this. Jenny's decision to reduce twins to a single fetus was never really in doubt. The idea of managing two infants at this point in her life terrified her. As the doctor inserted the needle into Jenny's abdomen, aiming at one of the fetuses, Jenny tried not to flinch, caught between intense relief and guilt. She said things would have been different if this had been a few years ago when, when we hadn't had any children and we were financially more secure. The number one reason for abortion, it's convenience. It's selfishness. Well, then there's some that say, well, and how, how many of you heard this before? Well, what about rape or incest? As many times as you would hear that, you would think it's just the norm. It's almost every abortion. There have been studies done. All the studies come in less than 1%. It's a very small, small uh, fraction, less than 1%. Nora McCorvey, you may not recognize her name, but she was the young woman called Roe in Roe v. Wade. She elicited sympathy from the court and media because she claimed to be a rape victim. But later she admitted she lied and hadn't been raped, just wanted an abortion. By the way, she later became a pro-life advocate. And uh, she passed away a few years ago, but she became a pro-life advocate. The point of how a child was conceived doesn't matter. It's that a child was conceived. Abortion compounds the trauma of rape. Creating a second victim that does not undo damage by the rape. The morality of abortion does not change based on the need. The abortion really comes down to, the argument really comes down to, is this a life or not? One of the members of our church sent me this article. Her name was Kathy Barnett. She wrote this article, and she says, I am the product of rape. My mother was 12 years old when she delivered me. My father was 21 years old. She said, I have nothing to do with my genesis. I had nothing to do with the conditions which I was conceived. I had no control over the circumstances that were swirling around me. I had no opportunity to partake in the cumulative decisions that would be made to to sustain the pregnancy. Yet, all the while, I was being fearfully and wonderfully woven together in my young mother's womb. My life has value. I'm not an inanimate object. I'm a person for me. I've given birth to... uh, Two beautiful, healthy, intelligent, and loving little people who are destined to grow up to be productive members of this great society. I am a veteran. I am a staunch lover of this country. I am a supportive sister, a respectful niece, and a devoted wife. Best of all, I get the opportunity now to care for my mother. Listen, rape is a terrible, terrible sin that God hates. So let's intensify the punishment for the rapist and not pass on judgment to the innocent. Why else has the abortion industry thrived? I think because of secret barbarity. The disgusting nature of the abortion industry. There is one abortion... I don't even want to use the word doctor, but one, uh, someone who would perform a doctor, Kermit Gosnell, maybe maybe you uh, have heard his name. He ran Philadelphia's House of Horrors. It was a millionaire abortionist, Kermit Gosnell, for 17 years. He ran a clinic. The clinic was called the Women's Medical Society. It was a cesspool of filth, blood-stained equipment, crumbling drawers and body parts in bags, uh, jars, and bottles. Gosnell proudly displayed jars of severed babies as trophies. And these were, these were when he was finally arrested for all the, all the disgusting uh, diseases that were spreading even in his abortion clinic. They found these in his car, these jars with severed babies' uh, body parts as trophies. No woman or child has ever been uh, harmed in an actual pregnancy care center. But since Roe, millions, about 55 million children and hundreds of women have died inside abortions, abortion clinics. The, the abortion advocates, they, they advocate like safe abortions. Like if it's outlawed, then there won't be any more. Listen, there's no such thing as a safe abortion. Abortion always ends in the murder of a child. There's no such thing as a safe abortion. Karen Sullivan Abel, she was a mom who had an abortion. She said, I wasn't told the truth about what an abortion might do to me. I could feel the baby moving and being torn from the inside. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut out portions of this because it's very graphic as she describes what she felt there on the table. She said she went home that night and she couldn't stop throwing up. 
I had reoccurring nightmares and dreams about her baby that she saw. I lay in bed and cried. I once wept so hard I sprained my ribs. They told me abortion was just like another surgery, no different from a root canal. Why don't people remember the anniversary of their root canal 20 years later? Why, do they find them, why don't they find themselves weeping uncontrollably, grieving the loss of their, of their appendix or their tonsils? Where are all the support groups and counselors working for those who've had root canals? Dr. Patricia Coleman of the Human Development and Family Studies, she's done research, and the research involved over 877,000 women. She states, 81% of the females who had an abortion were found to be at an increased risk for mental health problems, including depression, alcohol abuse, and suicidal behaviors. Why else, why else has the abortion industry continued to expand? I believe because of silent Christians. Christians who aren't standing up to speak against this evil in a prophetic way. Listen, as, as a church, we have different voice that we can use, right? We have an evangelistic voice, and sometimes we'll have a big campaign, and we'll go and we'll compel people to come to church. And that's, that's an evangelistic voice. And we, and we use that sometimes to get, get people here and compel them to come. But the church also has a prophetic voice, where we need to speak prophetically as God would speak into society. And to not do that, you, you, you've taken on a third voice, which is a heretical voice. We need Christians that will speak prophetically against the sins of... I'm not just talking about pastors. I'm talking about Christians who will stand up lovingly and kindly and with compassion, but speak against the evils. Amen. Some would say, well, maybe you've heard this before. Uh, you know, I'm against abortion, but it's not really my decision. I think that's where a lot of people land. I, I wouldn't do it, but hey, listen, it's, it's not my body. It's, it's not really my decision to make. If you were my neighbor and I saw you just beating a dog to the point where it's like, I need to call someone, I need to intervene. Is it my dog? No. Is it my property? No. But there's something morally reprehensible that's taking place. I need to make someone aware of it. It's not my body. It's not my property. But we as believers have a moral obligation to speak against the moral decline in our country. Some would say, here's one article, I'll give you just one example, uh, an article that says, these 25 Republicans, all white men, just voted to ban abortion in Alabama. I don't get the point. What does it matter what color their skin is? If something's wrong, you step up and you say it's wrong. It doesn't matter. We need everyone, red, yellow, black, and white, women, child, young and old, to stand up and say this is evil. This is an argument that gets brought up a lot. Like, oh, what are the, uh, stay out of our body. What, what are all these, these, old, these old men wanting to say? What, what do men want to say about our bodies? Listen, if it wasn't for some old white men, this, this type of thinking, we'd still have slavery in our country. I'm thankful for some old white men by the names of uh, Benjamin Lay and Benjamin Russ, William Lloyd Garrison, Abraham Lincoln, some just old white men that said, listen, this is wrong. And we should speak against what is wrong. So let me end with this. How should Christians respond to this issue? First of all, with conviction. Knowing what we believe. And knowing that what I think, listen, I, I, I happen to think that the unborn is a child. It's a human life. There's personhood there. I've seen ultrasounds. I've seen 3D ultrasounds. I've compared the pictures of them right afterwards. But listen, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what I think. What matters is what God thinks on the issue. And we need to look at this issue with conviction and with clarity. I'll tell you what God thinks of this. He hates it. The Bible says in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands, that shed innocent blood. God hates it. What is innocent? Listen, vertically, none of us are innocent. And standing before God, Almighty God, none of us are innocent. We're all wicked. We're all sinful. Horizontally, there are some that are innocent. I might accuse you of a crime and you say, I didn't, I didn't do that. I wasn't there. You have innocence. There's, there is no population more innocent than that of the unborn. And there's no population that is in such grave danger today. Abortion is taking place even just by, just by Planned Parenthood. About every 45 seconds, a baby is killed. We ought to stand up and say something about it. Abortion is the exact opposite of the gospel. The gospel says, I lay down my life for you. Abortion says, you lay down your life for me. And God hates it. 
There's one lady, her name is Gianna Jensen. Powerful testimony. She's a Christian, she's a believer. She survived an abortion. She was intended, she, uh, uh, it, was, it was intended for her life to be ended through an abortion. They injected chemicals into the womb. She still has uh, long-standing issues because of these issues. And she said this, the abortionist was not on duty yet. And she was born on the table during the, the abortion. The abortionist was not on duty yet, so he wasn't given the opportunity to continue with his plan for my life, which was death. Ironically, if you listen to her story, the abortionist had to sign the birth certificate. And she said that what he intended was death. Listen, what God wants for every single one of us is life and abundant life. He is the author, the architect of life. So we should respond to this issue with conviction. We should also respond to this issue with compassion. Jesus spoke and says, for when I was uh, hungry, uh, no one gave me to meat. I was thirsty and he gave me no to drink. I was a stranger and he took me a knot. Uh, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick, in prison, and visited me not. And they answered him, saying, Lord, when, thou saw the, uh, when we saw thee hunger and thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, did not minister unto thee. Like, how is that possible? And then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it unto me. The least of these. We should step up with compassion for the least of these. Jesus displayed compassion for children. Satan has, also, has, has throughout history shown uh, intentions to, to kill and murder children. This happened in Jesus' time. This happened in Moses', Moses time. But we should have a shared compassion as Jesus has had. Listen, real compassion results in real action. We, we, we're kind of messed up today in our society where we think that clicking is caring. We see something sad on the internet, on Facebook, we click like or we click share. Clicking isn't caring. Compassion is action. It's not enough. And maybe you're in here and you feel terrible about this, but feeling terrible is not going to do anything about this issue. We have to act and we have to act with compassion. What does that mean? What are some actions? So compassion is action. What are some things that we can do? I've already mentioned it, but first of all, we can speak for the unborn. There was a, a film a long time ago called The Silent Screams, because you can't hear them, but we can speak for them. Proverbs 31 says this, open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all that such are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth for the dumb. What does that mean? Speak on behalf of those who can't speak, who Jesus called the least of these. We can speak. The other thing we can do is we can, we can give, we can support. We can adopt. We heard a message at leadership conference over here, a wonderful message on adoption and how we are adopted by our Heavenly Father. But I think more Christians could adopt. It is crazy, and it was brought out in that message that abortion will cost between eight and forty thousand dollars, or a, uh, an adoption will cost between eight and forty thousand dollars, but abortion is about five hundred dollars. It's crazy. So we can speak. We can speak. We can uh, we can adopt. We can uh, we can vote. I don't think we can legislate morality in that we're not going to ever turn this country around by just simply how we vote, right? That's why we're here, and that's why I presume you're here on a holiday weekend. We're going to celebrate the independence, but you found it important enough to be here, and I believe because what happens here is the hope for our nation. But we can vote. So some will say, well, you can't legislate morality, but listen, if we can, if we can introduce and pass legislation that saves even just one life, I say it's worth it. We can educate. We can teach. We can counsel. I, I, I taught a similar lesson to our teens. I don't want to just assume, listen, they're getting bombarded with this. There's a man that came to our youth group. He's, he just graduated this last year. But he came to our youth group, and I, I, I asked him, how did you hear about our youth group? And this was his first time here on a, on a Bible study. And we ended up uh, later going through discipleship. And he told me he, he came to church because he was at school. He was debating this topic of abortion. He was actually debating for, for abortion. And he said, but something was not right in his heart. And he knew it wasn't right, but he didn't know why. And so he came to church. 
Listen, we need to know what we believe, and then we need to help others understand what we believe as well. We need to educate. If you've got a family, you should educate them on the value of life. We should counsel, support, so we should speak, and we should act with compassion. So we need to move forward with conviction, move forward with compassion, with action. But we also should move forward with courage. Ephesians says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done in secret. Who will rise up, Psalm 94 says, Who will rise up for me against the evildoers, or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquities? That should be us. That's our cue as Bible-believing Christians to stand up for the unborn. What does God see in the unborn? He doesn't just see potential, although he sees that. He sees a person. And he sees the pain that millions of babies every single year experience. God spoke to Moses one point in time. He said, I've heard your cries and I've seen. I know what's going on. I know that God's aware. And listen, we, we are ripe for the judgment of God. If God judges us tonight as a nation, we deserve it. What's the last thing that we can do? We can pray. And here's what we can do. We can, we can pray for, uh, for our nation. We can pray for the moms who are maybe, maybe finding themselves in a situation that they weren't aware of. Uh, maybe a, a, a pregnancy that they weren't anticipating. We can pray for them. But we can pray for God's grace upon our nation that he would turn this around and pray for a revival and awakening for God's word to take root in our communities and then other churches so that other individuals would see the value in their lives as God sees them as well. And we can pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. God, we know you hate the bloodshed of the innocent. And it occurs every day, every minute in our nation. Father, we ask for your forgiveness, but we also ask for your intervention. God, help us to seek your face. May we, may we find revival. May we be as a church, may we have courage and clarity and conviction to move forward on this issue. Speaking, perhaps, for those who don't have a voice. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Let's all stand up together. there's someone in this room and maybe, maybe this, is, this is all too real for you for one reason or another, you need to talk to someone. There will be people at the front that you can talk to. But here's how I would encourage all of us. I think this is our response tonight, that we would just pray. I'm inviting you to pray for our nation, to pray for those who not, are not even born yet. Pray for maybe a mom tonight who's contemplating this, this terrible decision right now. And would you pray for God's grace upon our nation? But then will you not just pray tonight, will you speak up with courage, with clarity, and with conviction. As Brother Williams begins to sing, you respond however God leads you.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time together tonight in your house and around your word. And Lord, I think tonight that there's a somberness in our heart as we think about the condition of our country. God, we so desperately need you. And I pray tonight that we will be reminded of how important it is to be salt and light. God, may we not be confronted with this truth and do nothing. Lord, help us to do our part, to stand for what is right, to defend those that are defenseless. God, we pray that you would send revival to our land. And may all of us in this room make a difference in at least the life of one. And I pray that we would take what we have heard tonight and do something with it. And we'll praise and thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. It often is humorous to see what people will argue about in person or in social media or something of this nature. All it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. I don't think a child of God can sit through a message like that and not feel an intense burden. We've got to do something. And let's take the challenge of the preacher to heart. Everyone in this room can pray every single day that God would reverse Roe versus Wade, that God would give conviction to those in positions of opportunity. Look at what has happened for life in just recent months of bills being passed and what's happening. We can speak up in the workplace, in our neighborhood, in conversations with family. We can teach the next generation. I don't know the last time you've considered what's being taught in a public school. It's not what we heard tonight. I can tell you that for right now. So if the next generation is going to know the truth, it's our responsibility to share it with them. And I hope that we will take tonight's challenge and do something with it. But Larry, thank you for the message. And I asked him earlier today, I said, how much time do you have in tonight's message? And I know he has a ton of time to invest in tonight's message. And Larry, thank you for that and the work into it. And it was a challenge to my heart. And I'm, I'm proud to be an American. Uh, I do believe this is the greatest country on the planet. But I believe we have some grave problems. And God's people must do something. And I hope we'll leave here tonight determined we're going to be a part of the solution.